Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. You're invited to join us on air asking your questions by calling in on the local rate phone numbers in the UK and the US, which can be found on ldnradio.org. Thank you for joining us. Today our guest speaker is Dr Thomas Cowan, who practices holistic medicine in San Francisco and prescribes LDN. He also has a very exciting new book called Human Hearts, Cosmic Hearts, which we'll be discussing at the end of the show. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemists are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Thank you for joining us today, Tom. People have been very excited to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. Wonderful. I have interviewed you before, but for those people that haven't heard that interview, could you tell us how long ago it was when you first got involved with LDN? So I was thinking of this last night. Uh, it's, It's sort of a little kind of interesting. The first time I heard of low-dose naltrexone, I believe, was in 1992. I had an, a patient with AIDS, although I'm not sure we knew he had AIDS. He was having a lot of trouble, and one day he came to me and asked if he could try low-dose naltrexone, and I had only, I, I had been an emergency room doctor for a while, and so I knew about naltrexone because of that. And I said, no, that's, that's not a good idea. That doesn't have any effect on this. And he didn't do it, and uh, subsequently he died. And I don't know if it was because he didn't take low-dose now. But uh, anyway, so that was the first time. And then I had uh, the next patient, uh, next time I heard about it was in 1996, where another patient with AIDS, and we knew that he had AIDS, he asked me about it, and I actually said, uh, I, I, you know, took the time at, at that point to look into it and said, well, this may be something interesting, and uh, I actually prescribed it, and he did better. And as far as I know, he actually was still alive at least five years ago. I moved from New Hampshire then, so I a little bit lost touch with him, but he, he sent me a Christmas card every year and up till five years ago, and I, either he's not alive or he just doesn't want to send me Christmas cards anymore. I'm not sure. Uh, That was the second one. And then the third one was a a friend of mine uh, had, was diagnosed with a terminal lymphoma. This was probably in the late nineties. And he actually, uh, he wasn't a friend at the time, but he was a good friend of a, a patient and friend of mine. He actually went to Bihari and did a combination of intravenous vitamin C and low-dose naltrexone and probably changed his diet and some other things. And he went into a full remission, and uh, a few years ago we were in Hawaii together with him, and he lived at least another, I don't know, 15, 16 years in very good health, and finally he, he succumbed to the, tr- to the disease. But He was really in fine health for at least 15 years. And that's when I decided I need to look into this. Mm -hmm. So it was 1999. And what conditions have you prescribed LDN for in that time? 
You know, I would say 95% of the cases have been with people with a, the variety of autoimmune disease. Uh, in the beginning, it was um, mostly ulcerative colitis and Crohn's and MS. Uh, those were the first three. And over time, I would say pretty much if I have uh, some evidence that this, what this person is suffering from is an autoimmune disease or at least something similar, I will give them at least a trial of low-dose naltrexone. I, I have used it occasionally for other things, like one might think, well, if, if my first bona fide case of success, it wasn't my patient, but the one I saw was lymphoma. I, I have treated some people with lymphoma. I remember somebody with cutaneous lymphoma that went into remission, largely, I think, because of LDN. My my experience with treating general cancer, you know, breast cancer and prostate and that, I would say has not been that successful. I don't know why, but I would say that was my experience. I even tried uh, to use opiate growth factor for a while, which was very hard to get, and it was kind of a pain to do that. And I don't think that was very successful either, so I... I'd say I, generally speaking, don't use it for cancer patients, although I, I still wonder whether that's a mistake, at least with some people, um, but that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. Have any of your patients reported to you any negative side effects? Uh, it's not uncommon. Uh, depends, I guess, what you mean by negative side effects. If you're talking about vivid dreams, I don't know how negative that is, but I'd say that's, that's a fair amount, like 20 to 40%. Uh, people talk about their sleep with low-dose naltrexone. Uh, what I tell people is 80% uh, of the people, it has no real effect on their sleep, at least after we, we find out what dose works for them. 10% have some sort of negative effect on their sleep, which, again, usually goes away once we find the dose. And interestingly, another 10% say they never slept better in their life, uh, which is also curious and doesn't necessarily last. But I've heard that more than once, so uh, that also can happen. But by and large, it has no negative effects other than that, at least that I've ever heard from patients. Mm -hmm. And in your experience, how long would you say it takes before a patient notices that LDN is doing something for them? Uh, I mean, I, I remember a guy, and this was a patient who, um, who I was treating for cancer, uh, and I remember giving him the first day a 4.5 milligram dose, which I generally don't do that anymore, but that, this was probably eight years ago. And I remember he was coming in for uh, so, what, what we were doing at the time, biomass therapy, and he came in to do his biomass the next day. And I walked in just to say hello, and he looked at me and he said something like, why the hell didn't you give me this? Five years ago, <laughs> it was like a light went on and he just felt this sense of well-being and energy that was literally immediate. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one extreme. I think I've seen people at six months it took until they noticed some positive effects. I start to get nervous around three months if if I if there's nothing, you know, no effect that the patient feels at all. Uh, then at three months, I start to get nervous that this may not work for them. But I will often persist, sometimes changing the dose until six months. So I could say that's about what I've seen as a fair trial. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And when you prescribe LDN for those people that have sleep disturbance, do you suggest them taking the dose in the morning or do you 
continue taking it at night? Uh, you know, I've certainly read, and I, you know, in in your book that that is now considered a viable option. You know, I I guess you could call me an LDN old timer of sorts. Mm-hmm. Uh, one usually likes to think of oneself as an old timer, but maybe that's you know vanity or something. But I probably am. I don't know how many people have been prescribing it for 18 years. Um, so what I learned was that you had to give it before bed. And I, I know that there's some question about that. Um, but I would say in 100% of the people, I start out before bed, no matter what they say. Mm-hmm. And it's only after fiddling with the dose, getting anywhere from, I'll go anywhere from 0.5, which is rare, or one milligram up to 4.5. I've never gone over 4.5. Um, if I can't find a dose that works, only then will I try it at some other time. I, I know that, that maybe I should modify that, but I can't say besides one person that I remember that I've seen the kind of positive effects with people taking it other than it before bed that I've seen with people taking it before bed. So I'm a little loath to make that change if I don't have to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll go to a break. And then when we come back, we will start taking callers questions. We'll be back in about two minutes. Thank you. The LDN Research Trust is very proud of the LDN book which was launched at the LDN 2016 conference in Orlando and has been a great success, not only for the medical profession, but for the patients wanting to learn more about low-dose naltrexone. Full details can be found on the homepage of the LDN Research Trust. Discounts are available on bulk orders of the book, which is 10 or more. For details, email me, linda at ldnrt.org telling me how many copies you wish and where you live. I will then be able to get Chelsea Green Publishing to contact you. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's chemists are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Well, our first guest that we were going to have on the show is Debbie. Hello Debbie, are you there? I am. What question would you like to ask Dr. Tom? I wonder if you have any experience using uh, the LDN with ET, essential thrombocythemia, or if you think it would be helpful? Yeah, um... You know, I think I can only remember one person with that, and I, my recollection is it didn't actually work. I don't okay. remember the details. I don't remember how long we did it. I mean, to a certain extent, uh, I, I would say, you know, I, I, I have a lot of little sayings. You know, everybody who's been around for a while They say the same things over and over again and sort of make their wife and family members cringe. So one of the things I say is if you're in a situation there's anything to do with cancer immunity or autoimmunity or any of those broad broad subjects or diseases, there's sort of no harm in trying LDN at least for six months, except, of course, if there's urgency with treating it. But if, if you have a kind of stable platelet number and the oncologists, hematologists are not recommending that you need any emergency treatment, 
I can certainly see using a trial of LDN for, you know, two, three, four months and seeing if it worked. What if I'm on hydroxyurea already, 500 milligrams three times a week, keeping my platelets at around 550 to 600? 550 to 600? Yes. Then I would say that strategy isn't working and, and you need to do something else. Now, whether you could try, I, I don't see any contraindication with adding LDN to that medicine. Um, I mean, that's reasonable. You okay. probably can't just stop stop it right away because that could be disastrous. So, I mean, I, I guess the first thing I would do is add it to what you're currently doing, see if the platelets went up to at least 10,000. I mean, that would be a stretch, but if that happened, then I would probably slowly taper the drug and see what happened, being very cautious about the whole enterprise. And do you think if it didn't help with the platelets, would it help with other issues like fatigue or the muscle pain or any GI issues that kind of go along with the whole syndrome? It might. I mean, you know, to a certain extent, LDN is, is idiosyncratic and it, it's incredibly dramatic in some people and it just doesn't help other people. And it's at this point in my life after treating literally thousands of people with it, I'm not sure I can predict who to. Well, I am sure. I can't. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you. This is exactly what I was thinking, is that it just couldn't hurt. It can't hurt, right. I've never yeah. seen any evidence that it would hurt anybody besides that sort of relatively adjustable and minor sleep issue. Right, right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Debbie. Okay. Good luck with you. Thank you. Next, we have a call from Jan, and uh, Jan was asking about LDN for breast cancer. I know that you're probably not the best person to put this to, Tom, but um, would you like to ask your question, Jan? Um, yes, my question is that I have breast cancer metastasized to my lung, and it's been about five years, and my my cancer numbers are pretty stable, but I but it's clearly still there. So I'm wondering if you have experience using LDN specifically for metastasized breast cancer. So if I may ask, do, to what do you account this five year stability? You're talking about five years of of known metastases in your lungs. Um, it's five years since I first had a metastasis in my lungs, and in 2011, I did have a cryoablation for the largest tumor, but a year ago, a PET scan showed there were many more tumors in my lungs, and in January of last year, I started taking Femara, but I've always used nutrition diet to try to control. I've, I've actually had cancer for 26 years. It just metastasized five years ago. Um, and my cancer marker numbers have stabilized since I've started taking Femara. Yeah. I mean, it's, this, is a, this, is, this is a complex question, which, uh, you know, I'd have to know sort of everything about your situation and what you've done and this previous history and all that stuff. But hmm. the, as far as the LDN goes, I mean, I don't see any harm in doing and adding a, you know, I would use 4.5 milligrams of LDN. I would use it with either uh, an oral form of alpha lipoic acid or an IV form if you can get it. And See, you know, give it two or three months, three months for you. For you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, got, I, I have no personal direct experience that this is going to sort of solve your problem. Right. 
I'm hearing an echo. Hearing an echo yes, on. me too. Well, thank you very much for your call, Jan. Good luck. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Bye. So, Tom, I wondered if you could answer a few of those email questions that I'd sent to you. Do you have them with you? I do. Um, do you want me to read them? Yes, please. Which ones you would like to answer? I mean, I'll just take them in order. Okay. Um, so the first one is, can LDN flare digestive issues and how would one prevent this? Uh, I mean, I, I, again, I suppose it's possible, but that's certainly not been my usual experience. Um, I, you know, it's not a homeopathic medicine one wouldn't expect you know, in a so-called exacerbation or a die-off or anything that one would think might flare up digestive issues. But, you know, having said that, there's always an adjustment time with medicine. And, you know, if you're essentially messing around with somebody's endorphins, which is essentially what you're doing with low-dose naltrexone, I could imagine that some people might have some kind of negative experience for a little bit, but that has not been my experience with patients taking low-dose naltrexone. It, it's, I would say, unusual, if not rare, for any worsening to occur. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the next Should one? I go on? Yes, please. It's, the next one is, I started out taking 1.5 milligrams every day, then increase to two pills every other day. I take one in the afternoon and the second at bedtime. Should I be taking both pills together? I mean, this gets into what we talked about before. I, I have very little, if any, experience either giving LDN at other times than bedtime or in dividing the dose. I mean, I certainly, certainly read your wonderful book and I I'd say my main conclusion after reading the book was I don't know everything by any means, everything about LDN, and probably I should. Um, so I could imagine there are situations where this might be work, work or called for, but I generally don't do that. So I give it all at once, whatever dose I'm going to do, and pretty much only at bedtime. The only other thing I would say is I, for years, had periodic conversations with Ian Zagan, who I think uh, you probably know is sort of the godfather of the LDN research in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. And every single time I would call him up and say, Ian, this didn't work for this particular patient, he, he basically always said, lower the dose or widen the interval. And it's very important to understand why, which is, you know, naltrexone itself doesn't do anything for the disease. Naltrexone blocks the opiate receptors so that you make more uh, endorphins to overcome the block. So the effect of the medicine is not direct. It's, it's to stimulate the person's body to do something. Uh, the interesting thing about that is, you know, naltrexone is probably the only standard pharmaceutical medicine that I routinely use on my patients because I generally don't like pharmaceutical medicines. But the effect of most natural medicines is very similar. It's, it's, they don't do anything. Like ginseng doesn't do anything to your adrenal glands but in response, your adrenal glands make more cortisone or regulate the cortisone if you take ginseng. So in a funny sort of way, naltrexone acts like a natural medicine, even though it's clearly not. And the, the reason I bring this up and the reason Ian would say widen the dose or decrease the amount is the effect is when you're not taking it. Uh, so if somebody's not having the effect, the benefits that you are, would hope to see, 
one thing you can do is lower the dose, and the other thing you can do is widen the interval. So I never used to give it every every other day. I always would just fiddle with the dose and still give it every day. But there is a rationale for giving it every other day, like this person suggests. Now, whether there's a rationale for giving it twice a day, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me because then you're using it for the effect, not the rebound effect, not the effect it, pr it provokes. But I do, I am aware, particularly after reading your book, that, you know, there is some direct effect of naltrexone on the various inflammatory systems in your body. I don't want to get into that because, A, it's complicated, and, B, I would get confused myself mm -hmm. trying to figure that out. But so there is that possibility, but I haven't seen that work with anybody yet, so I, I'm a little bit hesitant to endorse it. Okay. If you could address one more question. And then we will take a break and we'll talk about your book. Um, so there was a whole long question about vulvodynia and the possible effect of LDN. And just to say, I actually have two patients that I can remember with uh, exactly that or related things like... Um, interstitial cystitis and all that. And um, it definitely was, was dramatically helpful for those two people. I've seen it also for other vaginal issues, lichen sclerosis, uh, where it was absolutely beneficial. So this person with fibromyalgia, Hashimoto's, and vulvodynia, I would definitely try it. And generally speaking, I would try, you know, one milligram for one or two weeks. See it if anytime you have an effect, you don't increase the dose. So if you have a positive effect, you stay there. If no positive effect, go up to two milligrams or 2.25. If there's no effect from that, go up to three. And if there's no effect from that, about 4.5 milligrams. Um, she also says that she got possibly a rash from this. And I don't remember ever seeing anybody have an allergic reaction to LDN. In fact, I've seen people whose hay fever and other allergies, eczema, get clearly better under the treatment for LDN. So, you know, it's always possible or there may be an excipient in it that, she, that you're reacting to. And, you know, any medicine can cause an allergic reaction for some people. So, I guess I would lower the dose or stop it and then restart it and see what happens. Okay, well, thank you for that. We'll have a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about your new book. The LDN Health Tracker app, called My LDN, is available free for Androids, iPhones, Macs, PCs, iPads, and notebooks. The app allows you to keep track of all your medications, pain levels, sleep, quality of life, etc. You can print out graphs and charts to take to your doctor. Full details on the LDN Research Trust website. You can keep a journal so you won't ever forget anything again and set alarms. The app is free and all your information is held securely and anonymously. By using the app, you'll be taking part in the world's largest LDN survey, anonymously. Any questions, please email me, linda at ldnrt.org. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemist are the most cost effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 
6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Thank you. So, Tom, tell us about your book. I think it's got a very intriguing title, so I'm guessing it's all about the heart. Maybe you can tell us. So the title is uh, Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, and we actually made a website to support the book and put other articles related of interest called humanheartcosmicheart.com. So I would encourage all your listeners to check that out. And as I, I think I mentioned, there was basically two reasons I wrote the book. One was... Uh, because everybody more or less thinks that the heart is so-called pumps the blood. In other words, the reason the blood moves around the body is because the heart pushes it. And the first reason for writing the book was to essentially point out that that's, uh, for lack of a better word, ridiculous. And there's no possibility that the heart pumps the blood around the body. And if that's true, then the questions arise of, number one, why does the blood move around the body? And number two, what is the heart doing there in the first place if it's not so-called pumping the blood? And my part of the thesis of that is once people get away from thinking of the heart as a pump, it opens up entire worlds of information to understand all kinds of things, but particularly what our amazing hearts actually do. Uh, if you're stuck in this mechanical pump model, you miss it all and you miss a large part of the actual beauty of life in, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. The second part, sorry. <laughs> the second part was equally as entrenched in, in our culture and in our science and in our medicine is the theory that blockages in the coronary arteries are the sole cause of heart attacks. And again, uh, the, the second part of the book was to look at that theory, which is what it is, to realize that it's actually also basically ridiculous. It can't possibly be the case. And if that's true, you know, what is the role of, of blocked arteries and why do people actually have heart attacks if it's not from blocked arteries? And again, you know, we have a trillion dollar industry that's based on lowering cholesterol because cholesterol supposedly blocks the arteries, even though now nobody actually believes that anymore. Um, but we put people on low fat diets and we give them diabetes. Uh, based on that theory, we do you know, billions of dollars of bypasses and stents and angioplasties, all based on this, this coronary artery blockage theory, of which even the Mayo Clinic in 2003, in a major review article, claims, states, or in a sense proves, that for the vast majority of patients, stents, bypasses, and angioplasties, while they do relieve pain, they do nothing for improving the longevity or the survivalship of the patient. So we need a, a whole new look at this problem. We need to turn our gaze from what's happening in the coronary arteries, which is where all of conventional medicine and even up till now, all of alternative medicine has been focused to what actually happens in the heart. And so that's where my focus was. Mm -hmm. So where did you start? How did you get your research for the book? So, uh, you know, I, I've been connected with anthroposophical medicine for 35 or so years, maybe even actually more, 40 almost. And and that's the medicine of Rudolf Steiner and biodynamics and Waldorf schools. And his, you know, one of his fundamental claims in science, not that he was right about everything, but he was certainly an interesting guy. And he said, it's crucial that humans 
learn that the heart is not a pump. And so that idea intrigued me for decades, trying to figure out why I ended up um, going over this with an engineer in Royal Oak, Michigan named Ralph Marinelli, who, whose, whose article on the heart is not a pump is posted on that website. And, you know, after a while, it just became clear. And just, just to give you one example, so we have this one pound organ muscle called the heart, and we have enough blood vessels in our body to encircle the earth three different times. Or if you spread them out side by side, it would cover three different football fields or football pitches, I think you say in English. We do, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's a huge amount of blood. And, and we're told that this one pound muscle pushes this very viscous fluid through this gigantic amount of tubes. And even though they're the stuff in the blood, this, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, et cetera, are basically the diameter of most of the tubes called the capillaries. So how is it even possible that this organ pushes all this fluid through these you know, hundreds of miles or more of tubes? And the answer is it's actually not possible. Uh, it gets even worse than that, which I won't necessarily go into right now. But uh, once you go from that, and then you can start reading, you know, everything from engineering studies to, you know, physiological data on what happens in the heart. It turns out there's a vortex created in the heart or a spiral, which that uh, increases the momentum of the heart. It turns out that the heart actually sends little vortices of, of red blood cells to different organs, depending on the needs of that different organs. It turns out that the heart actually packages up little pieces of itself. If there's a cut in your leg and sends it directly to that cut to be used as a Band-Aid, there's a whole world of, of information that's clearly in the medical literature about what the heart does that's not that's different than this pumping action, which is what it actually doesn't do. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it. And again, a lot of those research articles I actually have posted in, in the future will post on my website because the goal is to develop a whole sort of community of people who are trying to create a heart-centered way of life and the first thing we have to do is get away from the mechanical pump model because that's a model of the dead earth and studying people as if they're essentially, you know, non-living entities and it's basically killing us. So that's one. The other idea about the, the what causes heart attacks, uh, you know, kind of came also serendipitously from being contacted by a Brazilian head of cardiology at a major cardiology center. And he wanted to run by me his idea of the so-called myogenic theory of heart disease, which, which produced a medicine called strophanthus, which was much more effective than the usual treatments of, of bypasses and stents and statins in preventing further heart attacks or having people die of heart disease. And, you know, again, I resisted it for a little while because thinking that it was all about the plaque is like mother's milk. But, you know, the evidence is very clear that it's actually not. And even it was controversial, this theory, in, in even in normal cardiology for a long time until for unusual reasons, let's just say, the coronary artery theory prevailed possibly or maybe because of the commercial interests involved. So it's a fascinating story. But again, uh, just, just to give you a flavor of it, uh, you know, I have all the time people come to me and they say they have a 95% blockage in their artery and their cardiologist said if they don't do a bypass soon, they're going to die if it blocks 97%. And 
what I learned to say to myself is, if you say you have a 95% blockage in your artery, meanwhile, a lot of those people, you know, have minimal symptoms like shortness of breath or the guy last week walked up a hill and he just didn't feel as well. How did he even walk up a hill with 5% blood flow to your heart? Like, how is that even possible? And then you mean to tell me that if you block from 5%, which is basically zero, to 3%, which is also basically zero, that's what's going to do you in. And frankly, I'm not buying it. 5% is 0%, and we have to figure out why that person is still up and walking even though they have 5% blood flow. And 90% of the procedures in this country are done on people who have 5% blood flow, yet are basically minimally symptomatic. And these procedures have not been shown to improve the length of their life. Well, that's amazing. And all of this is in your book, I take it. All of it is in my book. Uh, you know, the book is not, it, it's meant for anybody, anybody from somebody with no science education to a cardiologist to read. So, you know, there are studies and references, you know, you sort of have to do that. But, but, but my intention was to write a book that anybody can read, you know, it, it, like, I wouldn't call it a page turner, although some people have said it is, but, you know, understandable, clear evidence. And then I was hoping that the follow up with the more involved science stuff, that would be on my website. So that, that's sort of the structure. So, yes, anybody can read that book. Anybody can understand it. It's not rocket science. It's not like one dry study after another. There are studies. There is evidence. Uh, I'm not the first one to think of these things. But, uh, you know, I put it together in a way that the intention was anybody with any normal education could easily follow what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So tell us, how do we go about keeping a healthy heart? What should we be doing? Um, I mean, that's a great question. But, uh, you know, it's interesting because the answer to that comes from the science of how blood moves. And if you look at the flow of fluids in biological systems, the energy for for charging up the systems that creates the, the, the electrical impulse that creates the flow. And I, I'm, in a sense, deliberately being vague, mm -hmm. but you can read more about that. But the energy for that is sunlight, Earth energy, the Earth's electromagnetic field, and actually the touch of another human being or even a dog or a cat, another living being. So the first, question, the first answer to that question is people need to spend more time in nature, in the sunshine, walking, hope best with bare feet on the ocean, holding the hand of someone they love. If everybody did that for an hour a day, that would probably reduce heart disease by 20% in whatever country you're talking about. Now, the next thing is to eat a liberal, meaning a fair amount of good fats, which are coconut oil, olive oil, grass-fed butter or ghee, and that our predominant source of energy fuel should be good fats and particularly not refined carbohydrates. Any culture that eats carbohydrates, particularly refined carbohydrates, as their energy will end up with heart disease. The cultures that didn't, that ate basically high fat, good fat, modest protein, lots of vegetable diet, they more or less never had heart disease. So if people could do those two things, uh, that would go a long way towards resolving this epidemic of heart disease in all Western industrialized countries. And what does smoking, does that play a part in heart disease? 
Yes. It, it does. And interestingly, two of the consistent or the three consistent risk factors for heart disease that, that continue on through the decades, not high-fat diets, not cholesterol, but the three ones that really have been borne out are stress, diabetes, and smoking. Now, the interesting thing about those, all of those, is none of them have any effect on atherosclerosis or plaque development in major arteries. We all know, for instance, that diabetes affects the small blood vessels, not the large blood vessels. Yet, we know that diabetes is a risk factor for heart attacks, and we're told that small blood vessels have no effect on coronary uh, you know, heart attack risk. So how can that be? The same thing with smoking. Smoking deteriorates your small blood vessels, your capillaries. We're told that capillaries have no effect on heart disease. That's why we don't do bypasses for capillaries. We do bypasses for large coronary arteries. Yet we know that smoking is not good for your heart. It causes people to have heart attacks. So there's all these discrepancies, even in the basic research, uh, basic science of this. Yes, smoking, diabetes, and stress are bad for your heart. They affect the capillaries. They affect the metabolism in your heart. And those are the things that cause heart attacks, not the plaque in your coronary vessels. Mm -hmm. You spoke there about diet. What's your views on taking supplements and which supplements would you recommend? Uh, well, my view on taking supplements depends, of course, on the supplement. Uh, and it depends uh, also on the, what I'm trying to treat. You know, I, I've long said that, at least as a medical doctor and in my practice, I rarely, if ever, give people a supplement because it's, quote, good for them. I give them a supplement or a medicine to take because, you know, their foot hurts and I say, take LDN for six months or whatever and see if your foot doesn't hurt. That, that's not uh, because it's good for them. It's because they have some disease process that I want to try to affect by what I'm telling the person to do. So what I found uh, as far as supplements, now we're not talking medicines here particularly, if we're talking about heart disease, uh, it helps if you add extra vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 improves the metabolism of the heart and it directs the calcium towards the bones and away from the blood vessels. Both of those are helpful. K2 is a fat-soluble uh, substance which is found most concentrated in things like emu oil and natto, which is a fermented soybean. There's also some in miso. There's also some in sauerkraut. And there's also some in aged Gouda cheese and brie cheese. To make it simpler, I often, I, most of my heart patients take emu oil, which is probably the richest in K2, and that helps uh, their make appropriate calcification. Another uh, supplement that I use for heart patients in particular is a form of vitamin E. Vitamin E was shown by the Shute brothers, two medical doctors in Canada in the 40s. They treated 10,000 patients with angina. Over 80% had a clear and permanent remission, no surgery, no nothing, just 100 milligrams of vitamin E twice a day. And vitamin E has a lot of positive benefits, including improving blood flow and including uh, improving the cellular metabolism of the heart cells. So pretty much all my heart patients take a product called tocomins, which is just the sort of modern form of vitamin E, 100 milligrams twice a day. And those are the two, you know, if, if we're talking about heart, uh, those are the two main supplements. But I also always go back to diet. It all starts with diet and how we live, whether we move our bodies, have lives that are, you know, as stress-free as possible. We get out in the sun, 
hold hands or have some physical connection with somebody we love, and have also an expanded view of life, having a dry mechanical view of, of reality is not a very good uh, exercise for your health. And for diet, um, over here in England, organic food is very, very expensive. I know it's better for you. It hasn't got all the chemicals, etc., on it. What would you, could you just give us a, a brief overview of what you would say is a healthy diet? I mean... So first of all, expensive or not, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't eat non-organic food if at all possible. I, I understand people have financial constraints, but I'm telling you, if you have any chance of growing your own vegetables, I would do that. A healthy diet is very simple. It's at liberal amounts of good fats, which is grass-fed butter, uh, coconut oil, and, you know, the best quality uh, freshest olive oil, those are the three main fats. A modest amount of protein, which if you wanted numbers, uh, and that includes eggs, fish, meat, poultry, lamb, you know, all the protein foods, about a size of a deck of cards twice a day. That's about average. Lots of different vegetables, you know, root vegetables, leaf vegetables, fruit vegetables like zucchini, Lots of different colors, you know, 10, 20 a day, if possible. As many as you can get cooked, raw, blanched, steamed, baked, whatever is appropriate. Uh, then some fermented food, sauerkraut, miso, natto, soup broth, and berries or locally grown fruit for dessert. And that's the diet. A few mm -hmm. seeds and nuts mixed in. Very simple uh, no refined food, no GMO food. For me, no non-organic food. I just cannot see uh, eating pesticides or GMO foods. And what about um, rice? Do you eat rice? You know, so the, you're talking about are grains and richer carbohydrates appropriate? I would say yes, but in in sparing amounts. And if I have somebody who really needs remediation, whether it's autoimmune disease or heart disease, and I, by the way, think this sort of GAPS type diet or low carbohydrate, low grain diet is a perfect complement to using low dose naltrexone. So some of those people, I would say not rice for a while, uh, other people who are not so bad, you know, non-gluten grains or very heirloom uh, wheat uh, are probably okay if they're tolerated. Mm -hmm. So would you like to give people your website where they can learn more about the book? So the, uh, there's actually two websites that people might be interested. There's There's the Heart website, which is Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, all all spelled out one word. dot com. Human Heart, Cosmic Heart. dot com. And just as a side note, uh, the the importance of vegetable diversity in the diet is was so key to me that my family and I started a a entire business devoted on to increasing the vegetable diversity in people's diets. You know, it started out as a fun project, and now it's a, it's a bona fide business, uh, which is really helping people achieve vegetable diversity in their diets. And that website is drcowansgarden.com, which is D-R-C-O-W-A-N-S-G-A-R-D-E-N, drcowansgarden.com. And you can learn all about vegetable diversity. I even wrote a book, which you can see there, called How and Why to Eat More Vegetables. Well, I personally like to make vegetable soup. And I make it in a big batch and then freeze it. So that's a yeah. good way of getting vegetables into your diet, isn't it? The one thing I was going to mention... Every morning. 
Sorry? I eat vegetable soup with anywhere from five to 12 vegetables every morning almost. Wow, that's, that's pretty good going. We try to get it once a day. But um, like smoothies, if you have too many fruits, is that really high in sugar if you're a diabetic? Or if you're any person. I, I generally tell people the ratio of vegetables to fruit should be about 80% vegetables, 20% fruit. Mm. And if you're, if you're anywhere near a diabetic, a pre-diabetic or an overt diabetic, that ratio should probably go to 90 or even 95% to 5%. So fruit is good, but if you eat too much of it, there's too many carbohydrates, too many you know, easy, accessible carbohydrates, sugars. So th even that sometimes needs to be lessened. Mm -hmm. I know you said you have soup every day, but do you make vegetable smoothies? Not so much. I, I, I mean, we could do that with our powders, but I, I don't like that so much. I like, you know, real cooked food most more than I like smoothies. Mm. That's fine. And if people want to get hold of you um, and ask you questions, are the contact forms on your website or websites? Yes. Okay. Yes. They can, there's info. They go to somebody and then some of them come to me if they're appropriate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very I much. I will get them. Oh, good. <laughs> well, it's been really interesting. And I think everybody out there ought to go out and buy the book and find out how your heart works, how you can look after it, and hopefully live longer. Great. Well, thank you for this interview. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. LDN Health Tracker app, called My LDN, is available free for Androids, iPhones, Macs, PCs, iPads, and notebooks. The app allows you to keep track of all your medications, pain levels, sleep, quality of life, etc. You can print out graphs and charts to take to your doctor. Full details on the LDN Research Trust website. You can keep a journal so you won't ever forget anything again and set alarms. The app is free and all your information is held securely and anonymously. By using the app, you'll be taking part in the world's largest LDN survey, anonymously. Any questions, please email me, linda at ldnrt.org. Well, I can see we've had um, two and a half thousand listeners, so I'm sure that everybody is really interested in learning this and I would like to thank Dr Thomas Cowan very very much for sharing his experience with us any questions or comments you may have please email me linda l-i-n-d-a at l-d-n-r-t dot org I look forward to hearing from you thank you for joining us today we really appreciated your company until next time, stay safe and keep well. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's chemists are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts.